I won't lie, I'm quite overwhelmed between the use of my gadgets and the risks online. So that's why we're out at CyberCon Africa to get the latest on privacy as well as cybercrime. We're getting the lowdown from Pasi Koistinen all the way from Singapore. You're with a company called Kinkayo and your speciality is dark web and deep web. First up, what is the dark web? Well, dark web is a place in internet where uh, criminals conduct their activities. Uh, they use something called Tor, mm -hmm. I2P or Freenet protocols to access it technically. Deep net or deep web is different in a way, it's, it's usually legal. Uh, sites that have access, access control to access it, so we are talking about digital archives of, of academic institutions and so, that sort of things. Mm. And we also have surface web that we usually use. We usually call it the internet only. So dark web is our specialty. We can search it, we can monitor it, and that's what we do. And one of the differences between like normal internet that we use is that you cannot access the deep and dark web with Google search engine. You actually are dealing in that niche where you're creating those search engines for deep and dark webs. Yeah, we provide the visibility there. Uh, a normal user would have to install something called a Tor browser and find a site hmm. with an onion name on it. Okay. It's not a dot-com business in a way. Layers. Yeah. <laughs> so what kind of business goes down? What is the kind of variety and industries that actually make the most use of these webs? Dark web, usually it's used for strong anonymity and the users of that place are uh, cyber criminals. Sometimes people who just want the strong anonymity for their work, but mainly for criminal activities. And it's huge. Dark web is much, much larger than the visible web. So, access of information and data, could I purchase organs on the deep dark web? Probably yes. The main rule for the dark web is that if you know about the crime, it's probably there. Mm. They have personal information, they have credit card information, they combine those two together and they have usernames, passwords for people, something called uh, doxing, that is collecting your personal information for payment. You can buy all of these crimes as a service, of course. And then they have medical information, uh, credit cards, mm. whole a bunch of them, actually. I mean, day to day we're seeing people's anonymity being tapped into. One of the most recent cases was the Ashley Madison case, where a lot of people's dating goings on was revealed yeah. to the world. Yeah, Ashley Mad Madison was a was a site that sold services to unfaithful husbands mostly, and the hack in hack involved uh, the sale of that data. I actually downloaded some of that data just to see if there is any Finnish people on the or Singaporean people on the database and they were there or well, some of my neighbors were there. I was surprised to find them there. On that note, how demanding is the dark and deep web becoming and to manage what's happening there? It's very complex to be honest. Um, you need to be a specialist just to find the places and even more specialized just to uh, understand the volumes and the dynamics of the business that they, the criminals conduct there. And of course there are many organizations that, that would like to know about this. It's open because it's totally anonymous. Pasi, what are some of the obvious differences between normal internet and the dark deep web? Well, if you come from the user perspective, uh, when you enter the normal internet and you type in a domain name, you would find normally the same information always there. Pages that just don't disappear. They usually are there. Uh, there's a difference in dark web because uh, the criminals usually use it for advertisement and sale purposes. So once the information is being traded, it's kind of lost usually. The lifespan of information there could be just minutes, maybe hours max. And that that's kind of demanding if you want to follow up on the on those sale activities there. So what you're saying to me is the lifespan of information on the deep dark web is kind of like Snapchat, actually. Yeah, it's very short. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much, Pasi. And there you have it. If you want to know more about the deep dark web, you can certainly call this man in black. Well, stay with us because after this, we'll be chatting to more speakers. We're talking ghosting and cybercrime with Sharon Knowles from Da Vinci Forensics. Sharon, tell me about some of the 
tough dangers to the normal man going online right now? Well, I think uh, some of the main dangers would be losing their identity or being careless when they go online and they actually post stuff about their, their home life, their whereabouts, like when they check in on Facebook and say, I'm going on holiday, that type of thing. Aha. So be a little bit more discreet about your whereabouts. Give yes. a little less, you would say, is I'd actually give, safer? I'd say give a little less. Tell me a little bit about ghosting. It's quite an interesting turn of events in cyberspace. Well, ghosting is uh, quite not new, but it's relatively new to South Africa. And that is where a foreign owner of a site, um, like the Russians, and they'd host a site behind a credible site here in South Africa without the owner being aware of it. Mm. So they, a couple of folders down, they hide a folder with all their sites and they direct traffic to this actual false site. Wow. Okay, so how would one even track someone down that's doing that? Well, a lot of small business owners today have uh, web administrators that they have running their site in that. So if there's any unusual activity that gets noticed, like, you know, a lot of bandwidth that's being used or strange mails that are coming through, the web administrator should, you know, just say, let me check, let me go and have a look and see if there's anything strange, but they would need to contact somebody who is in the know-how to actually have a look through all those files and make sure there's nothing strange there. I want to know, as the thief, what do you gain by actually doing this? Well, you get free hosting, free bandwidth, and the thing that they capitalize on is that the site's reputation. They usually go for small sites with a good reputation, so those sites aren't picked up initially as hosting bad traffic. All right, any other crimes to put at the top of our awareness list? Well, I think, you know, the usual phishing scams, that seems to be increasing in South Africa, clicking on links, and especially these letters that you get from your bank saying you've won your awards, that type of thing. You need to be really, really careful, you know, with, with that type of, type of thing. Well, thanks so much, Sharon. I spy that we need to be a little bit more careful out in these online streets. The Edge crew is catching up with Seize Where Snail Come Tuesday from Snail Attorneys. Now, you're talking cybercrime and the cybersecurity bull to us that's been updated since 2002. How does this affect us? Well, the cybercrime bill and cybersecurity bill, as they call it, is an update on the section dealing with cybersecurity as well as cybercrimes from the ECT Act. It has been there, like you said, for the last 10 years. So because of the evolution of technology, because of the, the changes in the modus operandi of cyber criminality, we need to try and, and have different ways of dealing with it. So since it's been updated, can you give us some of the examples of how things have changed? Yeah, I mean, the ECT only covered, I think, five or six crimes at that stage. We're now dealing with aspects of uh, cyber espionage, cyber terrorism, We've got a provision dealing with xenophobic attacks. Mm. There's a provision specifically dealing with prohibited financial transactions. So the, the net has been cast wider with regards to what it is that you can do online that may effectively be seen as a criminal action. Along with the law evolving, gadgets have two. It's everything from cell phones, desktops, laptops, tablets. How much evidence is it worth in a case now? Well, the, the law of evidence was improvised in the Electronic Communications Transactions Act already, which basically says that any electronic evidence is evidence. So the, the words, everything that we have will be used against you, will be used against you. In other words, the electronic evidence has the same status just like any other documentary evidence. Anything that you personally feel we should really do from day to day to protect ourselves or not do, do we overshare? <laughs> well, I think, I think the, the way people conduct themselves online, the way people conduct themselves on their computers, does have a bearing on, on the risks and the way in which they're exposed to cyber criminality. I think the less social media is being used, the less one uses his or her credit cards on different websites, the less you will be exposed to a possible cyber attack. How demanding do you feel this subject matter has actually become over the years? Well, for a very long time people weren't taking this subject matter very serious, calling it uh, PlayStation Law. 
you know. I remember once upon a time when I was at Varsity being called a PlayStation lawyer. But yeah, it's not about PlayStations anymore. It's serious stuff now. It affects you, it affects me, it affects big corporates, it affects governments. It's, it's what's happening right now. Well, thank you so much, Suzwe. As he said, anything you say or do online can and will be used against you.